Instead of actually finding what's good about them and helping them thrive and looking at their strengths and helping them grow, we're asking questions like, are you depressed? Do you have negative thoughts? Do you feel guilty? And we're challenging people to express to us how terrible their lives are. Now, I'm going to hit you off the gate with a question that I need to know. Is a mental health diagnosis more detrimental or beneficial to the patient? It's a great question. And to be honest, I think it has a direct answer. And we're not really talking about this too much in the psychiatry industry, but the diagnostics of mental illness are far more limiting than they are beneficial, in my opinion. Mm. I think when we tell people that they're sick, but it's a subjective illness that we're talking about, depression, anxiety, these aren't things where we're checking your blood or doing an image of your brain. We're telling you from a list of criteria of symptoms that you suffer from a disease. And now we're putting them in a sick model, telling them that they're sick. And so instead of actually finding what's good about them and helping them thrive and looking at their strengths and helping them grow, we're asking questions like, are you depressed? Do you have negative thoughts? Do you feel guilty? And we're challenging people to express to us how terrible their lives are. Mm -hmm. And if you think about just the placebo effect of that, right, where you come into the office and talk about how miserable things are, rather than coming into the office and talking about how you see potential and the ability to grow in this area of your life, or you have this strength that maybe just hasn't been shiny in a while, but mm. let's shed some light on it. And so, you know, instead of asking people what's wrong with them in our office, we try to ask what's right with you. And the DSM really, it's there for a reason, right? We have to follow the insurance guidelines, the medication clinical trials. There has to be an organization to this approach in medicine. But unfortunately, I think it's become more limiting than it has become helpful. Mm. And I hear so many people go, wow, I just got diagnosed with anxiety. Now everything makes sense. And then as we were talking off air, you know, there's clouds outside, my anxiety's kicking in, right? Mm -hmm. Or I got diagnosed with depression, now everything makes sense. This thing is making me depressed, I am depressed. And where is that light being shed into, again, as you said, the potential? Mm -hmm. the potentiality of, of a human being to move through that. And um, I know you were uh, f going into traditional psychiatry. And what was it, and I'm always fascinated by people, what is their moment where they go, I was going here, I'm not vibing with this because of this, now I'm going into something new, which actually happens to be your sole purpose. Yeah. Uh, what was the moment? Was there a moment that you found that to yeah, be true? Yeah, absolutely. I think we both have stories about how we've arrived to the service that we're providing for the community. And my story starts really in residency. You know, I was excited to get into mental health. I, I wanted to help people. I, this was my calling. But then when I started residency, they started us in the inpatient psychiatric hospitals. There's not a lot of good work being done there, unfortunately. It's a very difficult system because this is, you know, the most sick people who really are suffering in a way that they need more love, more care, and more nourishment, but all we're doing is locking them up, yeah. adjusting their meds and saying, are you no longer suicidal? Is my liability covered? Okay, now you can leave. And it's really unfortunate. And when I saw that in residency, I'm sitting here thinking, where is the healing? Where's the help? It wasn't until my third year of residency that I started practicing outpatient, meaning in the community, right? helping people uh, not in their rock bottom moments where they have to be locked up and monitored for safety, but rather they're just struggling and they want some help. In that community, it became very clear to me, this is where we can make impact. Mm. But what are the tools we're taught? In, in medical school and residency, we're taught uh, you know, the kind of archaic uh, methods of monoamine hypothesis, right? serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, we're taught four hours of nutrition in medical school. Crazy. <laughs> four hours. <laughs> Crazy. How much of our mental health comes from what we eat. Exactly. Right? And so for me, it was that shift of feeling rebellious, you know, and I, this isn't what I signed up for, to all of a sudden seeing the light of, okay, here's an opportunity to help people. Now, how can we get there? And the medical model for psychiatry is the biopsychosocial uh, spiritual model, where you look at the physical, the, the mental, the social aspects, and the spiritual aspects. But that's not the common modality when you go see a psychiatrist. I, it's horror stories I hear from my patients. And you're the first psychiatrist that looked me in my eyes. Mm. Right? You, everyone else is just typing on their computer. They talk to me for five minutes and give me a medication. 
It's like, how do you even know in this chemical soup that we are, after five minutes, what to add or what to remove, right? And so going through all of that, the trials, figuring out that there's a better way to do this, really kind of released the tension that I felt, you know, the anger towards the industry. Mm -hmm. And it really just helped me align and find that there are people like you and people, healers of all modalities that are helping with mental health. It doesn't just have to be the medical management that we think traditionally in psychiatry. And so, you know, I can dive much deeper into my calling and purpose of why we got there, but I think that was the big shift of seeing how it wasn't working, seeing how it could work, and then really just choosing a path, saying, am I going to fight this battle or am I going to go, you know, with the current but help mold it in a better way? Right. So powerful. Thank you for sharing that because I'm always inspired by those moments. I oftentimes ask guests, like, what was that moment? Because you're doing something really powerful for the world, but it doesn't come with sometimes those tribulations where we go, this is not resonating. I don't feel good. Sometimes even tragedy, but out of that energy uh, sprouts like this amazing Absolutely. And I think it's the composition of everything we we do in our lives. Like, I would love to know your full story of Mm. how you got to realizing that being an educator is the biggest impact that maybe you can have, and you're having a huge impact in that way. For me, it was in medical school, doing rotations in the emergency room and the clinic. You know, you don't get that vibe of uh, appreciation and compassion. It's just very, a lot of burnout. We talked about it earlier, right? Mm -hmm. I was volunteering at a a nonprofit clinic, free medical care. Actually, they didn't say free. They said, you have to pay it forward. You have to do three acts of kindness in the community, write a letter about it, and bring it back. Mm. And that's your form of payment for medical services. Being a young medical student, you know, I didn't know much. I'm still learning. I had a lady come in and she had severe knee pain. I'm thinking, we don't have an x-ray at this, you know, right. facility. Like, what can we do for her? We're going to write some anti-inflammatories. Mm-hmm. After every session with the patient, we taught her some stretching, things like that. After every session, we ask the patient, would you like us to pray with you? Non-denominational, no religion or anything, but just, you know, would you like us to pray? And she said, yes. We all got around her, huddled up, and just kind of said a prayer. All of a sudden, she just starts crying. Right? And I'm a young impressionable, young, impressionable medical student. And I see this, and we're thinking, like, what happened? What went wrong? And she looks up, and she says, for the first time in years, I don't feel my knee pain. Mm. I'm thinking, they didn't teach me this in the medical school books. <laughs> right? And it's really just the power of love. Mm-hmm. And so being of love, you know, we, we always know that love is medicine, but... We, we think, okay, let's be compassionate and give the medication, but what if we just prescribed love? You know, and that was a pivotal time for me to realize that there's more than what the textbooks are teaching us. There's something powerful here that we're not fully tapped into with Western medicine. One of my favorite partners that we've been working with for quite a while now, and I really get behind, is Athletic Greens. This is a product I use every single day. I started taking this because I just wanted to supplement my vegetable, my greens, my fruit intake. I wanted all those phytonutrients when I'm on the go, and oftentimes I'm running in and out of the house. So I use Athletic Greens, and it's been helpful for my energy and focus. I've been on it for about six months now, and I really do love it. Athletic Greens doesn't taste super healthy. And what I mean by that is we often associate the taste of health with something earthy or grassy or supplementy, whatever it is. But Athletic Greens has a really mild tropical taste that is a mix of the vanilla and pineapple flavors in there. So it tastes really good and you look forward to it every single morning. So what is this stuff? One scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to really get the day going and start it right. It contains less than a gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, no artificial anything, while still tasting good. And it's helping support better sleep, better recovery, better mental clarity, and better alertness. AG1 is a small micro habit and it has major benefits. And it's one thing you can do every single day to take care of yourself. And you know, here at Heal Thyself, we only partner with brands that we truly believe in. Athletic Greens is one of them, and they're a great company focused on one of my favorite words for next year, and forever, sustainability. For one, they are climate neutral certified company, and in 2020, they purchased carbon credits that supports projects protecting old growth rainforests. I just went to the Amazon, you know how much I appreciate this stuff. Additionally, for every purchase, they donate to organizations helping kids get nutritious food who are in need, including No Kid Hungry here in the United States. And in 2020, they donated over 1.2 million meals to children. 
So right now is the time to reclaim your health. Right now is the time to get it going. Get the antioxidants flowing. Get it in your body. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs of Athletic Greens AG1 with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash heal thyself. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash heal thyself to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Ned's Mellow Magnesium is one of my favorite magnesiums out there. It's a powerful daily magnesium supplement, but one of my favorite things is that it also is put together with amino acids and trace minerals. What this does is it allows absorbability and has a more expansive effect on the body. With Ned's Mellow Magnesium, I'm experiencing better sleep, less stress, less inflammation, and less pain overall. I love Ned's products, and here's why. They're science-backed, and they're fully transparent. They offer third-party testing. You can see it on the website. Go look at it for yourself. They're going to offer all of their testing for each of their ingredients in every single one of their products. That's what I call transparency. And when it comes to their CBD, they have a full spectrum of active cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, and trichomes. Ned's Full Spectrum Hemp nourishes the body's endocannabinoid system and offers functional support for stress, sleep, inflammation, and just balance. So become the best version of yourself and get 15% off of Ned's products with the code DRG. Go to helloned.com slash DRG and enter the code DRG at checkout. Again, that's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com slash DRG to get 15% off. And thank you, Ned, for sponsoring the show and offering you, the Heal Thyself listeners, an awesome natural remedy for some of life's most common health issues. Derek, I know your story of finding healing and growth for, for yourself, for your family, kind of sets you towards this direction, right? Yeah. Uh, I grew up in a little farm town in Wisconsin, not, you know, on a farm. That's Those are the rich kids. You know, it was a little, little farm town. Yeah. And uh, when I came to Los Angeles, uh, originally I, was, uh, I wanted to be a writer. And, and I was in the entertainment world and... Uh, came that turned into you know as things in Los Angeles do turns into and now I'm a stuntman now, now I'm an actor you know it turned into all kinds of you know incredibly interesting and twists and turns and opportunities. Um, my mom's been uh, I guess pretty sick most of my life and and um, you know fibromyalgia cancer MS uh, you you know you name it and it's just uh, I don't know if you know back to the power of the mind like how much of it is uh, you know our own doing and um, and how much of it's actually there, but you know, I think there's a lot of psychosomatic and also a lot of, uh, you know, just making high, was it hypochondriac. Is that, is that the, yeah? I mean, let's talk about iatrogenic, you know, causes of, mm-hmm. of medical issues, right? right? Yeah. How many over doctors over. are causing the injury? Yeah, and well, and that's where she's and now it's early onset Alzheimer's, right? And it's you know, every here's taking this medication, chew to you know, save your right arm to chew off your left arm, right? Yeah. And um, and so I uh, went back home to. You know, help her out uh, when 2015, uh, when she was in a really bad, you know, hasn't been able to get out of bed for a few days. I uh, went back home to uh, help her out. We ended up taking a, a road trip, you know, across the country, and we're hitting every kind of voodoo witch doctor we can find, and you know, every any kind of healing uh, modality. Uh, ended up at a, at a clinic where they were doing high CBD suppositories. This is 2016. And I'd never heard of CBD. I tried giving her cannabis edibles before and it made her very sick. Um, I'd never heard of yeah CBD, but, and it really helped her, you know, really helped her get off of medications. Um, and, and it helped her kind of, she was more my mom again, you know. And I was like, how is something with years of every kind of doctor, every kind of specialist, and this is a plant that's, accept- well, it wasn't accessible at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I started a company called Healing Ventures, which at the time was going to be brand incubation kind of thing. Uh, you know, long, long story long, uh, that that industry blew up, and and our company became uh, we got a, we, we got acquired by our main supply chain partner. Uh, I was on a really good run, and and you know from humble beginnings to a really great couple of years. Every pharmaceutical, tobacco, cosmetics, every industry turned into the CBD industry after yeah. like you know after twenty like after the twenty eighteen farm bill, and I was you know I was traveling the world, which is always a dream of mine, and. Um, just around the most fascinating, interesting, you know, people uh, was with the girl of my dreams at the at the time uh, for you know a couple of years, and we were looking at getting married. Within a uh, two month kind of span, like six week span, uh, the company I was at, we were going through a big acquisition, and during this uh, period, there was 
uh, yeah, found out that you know there was my equity or my my, my contribution was essentially not um, you know not what it was supposed to be, mm. and, and 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 the agreement, and then so that really kind of crushed you know uh, a lot of of who you know at the time I didn't realize it, but that really hurt. And then the girl that I was with for years uh, had, had brought somebody back to uh, our place uh, when I was you know mm. working and. And blamed it on me for working too much, and uh, you know, so it, it. I didn't realize it at the time, and I never thought depression or suicide would ever be, um, you know, a part of of my life. I've always been pretty ambitious and pretty, um, you know, I keep myself very busy, and right. and so where you know I don't really have the the time to allow myself to process, uh, you know, whether the good or the bad, and I went from you know feeling kind of you know untouchable and on top of the world for like a good year and a half, two years to, um, I identified who I was as a person, you know, with my relationship and my, my, my work. And then when both of those in a short period of time took a 180, I was, you know, I was mentally rock bottom. You know, I was, I was lost in every day. Um, and it just kept getting worse and worse. And, and like, you know, the thoughts were, um, yeah, I felt like, I was drowning and everybody else around me was was breathing. The only thing that was keeping me alive was like the thought of my mom mm-hmm. and, and how I couldn't do this to her. A friend of mine came over and brought me. He was like, you need help. Like, yeah, you know, I do. And this was a couple months later and uh, brings me into a ketamine clinic. And I was like, I'm not doing this. You know, this is this is absurd. My whole ethos was plant-based medicine. Right. right? And that's where I found healing. That's where, you know, seeing my mom, you know, be on every kind of medication growing up. I was like, I, you know, and the, and the academy is a horse tranquilizer. Yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this. This is foolish. And it's fifteen hundred dollars for one session, then, mm-hmm. right? And growing up, you know, where I grew up, I don't. You don't spend two hundred dollars on your mental health, much less fifteen hundred. Right. So, I went in and uh, very apprehensive. But I see, you know, Harvard credentials on the wall. I see, you know, and starting to like, okay, let's maybe, you know, what else? What do I got to lose here? And I start telling my story of, you know, to the doctor why I'm there. And uh, he cuts me off about two minutes in, and he just looks at me, and he says, have you ever tried uh, ketamine before? And I said, no, I haven't. I said, have you tried mushrooms? I said, yes, I have. And he goes, all right, you'll be fine. And then, you know, brings me into the room, and they, you know, did the blood pressure, plugged me in, and it was, you know, at the time, probably the most, single most profound experience of my entire life. You know, it, it... it allowed me to process and let go of, you know, this, these things that I was kind of drowning myself in and, and really reconnect with myself and, and spend that quality time with myself. And I hadn't felt, you know, I've just felt so alone for, you know, for quite some time. And it allowed me to just shake all that off, that shame or guilt or, you know, anger or, or resentment or depression and, and, and just let it all go and just kind of step away from my thoughts and, and realize that I am not like all of these, you know, these things. And, and I'm not, you know, we are not our thoughts, right? And to process it and just, you know, that one session took me from being this unrecognizable version of myself to 90% bad. Like there were still underlying issues, you know, that I had to deal with, but I was, you know, I was comfortable in my own skin again, right? I was me again. And it was, I mean, I could write a novel about, you know, that first experience and, and what it did for me. And after the experience, like, all you want to do is talk about it, right? And because I'm like, I went from in a hole to this very incredible um, kind of rapid transformation. And the doctor, you know, comes back in and you know, he goes, what are you doing next week? And I was like, I, you know, I, I don't know. And he's like, all right, we'll, we'll put you back in if you, you want to come back in. You know, you have... Hang out, hang out here, and that was my integration. Hang out here, you can call your Uber, and I was just like, uh, 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 <laughs> like "What just happened?" I've never, yeah, I was like, "What?" Like, you, yeah. just, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. and um, and so that was my first experience, right? and fifteen hundred dollars, and and there was, you know, no kind of preparation going into it, nothing post, right. and and you know, not so much that day because that day I was still um, pretty, just like, you know amazed and trying to process like you know how, how the experience was but it was how i felt the next day and the day after that you know and because that night i was like am i going to wake up tomorrow feeling like how i have been right and the next day i, I went for a run for the first time you know i was mm. uh, in forever and 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 being able to um you know 
have this rapid, like this most in- incredible experience. And I've been, in, I was in healthcare and biotech prior to this, right? And I had no idea this kind of treatment even existed. Mm. And then having this powerful experience and not, uh, and seeing how powerful it was, but how poorly executed um, it was and how cost prohibitive it was. Uh, yeah, and that's you know, long story long of how I, how right, I got right. into it. And, and that set the stage through your experience and mm-hmm. ultimately experiencing it, the ketamine and how it helped you, mm-hmm. but really the model and how it didn't align with what you wanted to bring to society. Yeah. Uh, and, well, initially when, it, when I did it, I didn't think about like, you know, I, I was just blown away how it helped me. Mm-hmm. And then that led me to, uh, to connecting with uh, the Psychedelic Research uh, Institute at Stanford and, and a clinical, the clinic, depression clinic there, and meeting all these incredible doctors. When I told him, like a, a friend of mine at, at dinner about the experience of connecting with this doctor, he was like, you have no idea. And, and you know, that's where I learned Ibogaine for opiate addiction, MDMA for PTSD, a derivative of LSD for Alzheimer's, and all of these, you know, incredible things. Uh, and then I tell him about, you know, my ketamine experience, and then, and how it was like how terrible of like the uh, pre and post or non existent right. it was, and you know how it could be done better. And that's when I, you know, started to then also f- try and find like the best. You know, not just the best doctor, but the best doctors, but the best human that I could find. Because what happened, you know, in the previous uh, venture, and you know, and looking at mental health and psychiatry, like Sam said, you know, it's it's uh, you know over a lot of over prescribing, over diagnosing. And first meeting that I had with Sam, uh, you know, he's whiteboarding uh, on, on the wall. He's, he's uh, I, I, we were there to to talk about you know about. Um, how we could potentially, you know, come together to help more people, and he's, you know, Jedi mind tricks me to, uh, we're doing, you know, my life map on on the wall, <laughs> right? And he's like, all right, well, during this point in your life, were you depressed, right? Mm-hmm. Or were you just going through loss or heartbreak, right? Mm-hmm. During this point in your life, did you have anxiety or you got a lot on your on your plate, right? Yeah. And um, and really shift my perspective because I was identifying with like, okay, now I'm now I'm a dep- now I have a depression, now I'm a depressed person. What's you know, what are these things that are going to trigger me in my everyday life? Right, and and that's a model we're living by, mm-hmm. right? The models we're living by. I've been diagnosed, mm-hmm. and therefore I've been told that these are my triggers, or I know that these make me feel dysregulated. But the the question is, is how do we regulate ourselves? Well, mm-hmm. it, all right, physically from the stuff we eat, uh, the, our gut health, yeah. But what about the emotional connection we have to ourselves, to each other? Um, that's why I personally, it's it's funny because there's a, a a yarn connecting all of us. Mm-hmm. And it is uh, our love for really bringing back uh, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical health all together mm-hmm. in a human being. And we all do it through different, well, you both like have the passion, I do it with emotional release, but really it's like dysregulation of the human organism based on emotions that have happened, life experiences that have happened, identities that we had that are false, we're not you, work, and, and you know, you put all your energy into that, and who you are was based on that. And then just allowing through, you know, ketamine and just having this experience for the brain to reorganize and go, no, you're actually out of this hole. Here's the ladder to get out of this hole. Now you're out. Now you can step into who you are. It's so powerful that there's even an agent out there that can really help people like that. Right, and people don't know about it. Yeah. Right? If you're suicidal right now, and you go to a psychiatrist, they're going to be Prozac. Yeah. And what does the psychiatrist say? It's going to take a month or two to even kick in. Might have to increase the dose three, four. I'm suicidal today. You want me to wait a month or two for this pill you're giving me to start working? Well, we often hear that the average adult should spend about seven to nine hours of sleep each night That's not always possible. Now, more and more people are forced to make a lifestyle change just to get deep sleep. So the first half of the night is your deep sleep window. That's when things start to drop, right? Your heart rate, your breathing, your blood pressure, your muscle activity, and your body temperature. And since that temperature drop is such a crucial aspect of deep sleep, you got to find a way to activate that sleep switch to help increase your levels of deep sleep. This is where chilly sleep comes in. Chili Sleep makes customizable, climate-controlled sleep solutions that help you improve your entire well-being. They make the new Doc Pro, the Uller, 
the Cube Sleep System. And what these are are hydro-powered, temperature-controlled mattress toppers that fit over your existing mattress and provide the ideal sleep temperature. And they're luxury mattress pads that keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep sleep. So whether you sleep hot or you sleep cold, these systems are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and really give you the confidence and energy to power throughout your day the next morning. Now imagine waking up, not feeling tired. It ain't a pipe dream. Chill Sleep can make it happen. So visit the link below and use the code DRG15 for 15% off of the new Doc Pro Sleep System and DRG30 for 30% off of the full Uller, the Cube, and the Chili Blanket Sleep Systems. These are offers that are only available exclusively to you, the Helios Help listener. Nine out of 10, ten psychiatrists don't even really understand ketamine therapy right now. The fact that within four to 24 hours, people who are suicidal no longer have suicidal thoughts. It is miraculous that we have this. And so, you know, can we educate people and, and allow this tool to teach us more about the way we're treating uh, our patients and ourselves? You know, that's what I'm excited about with psychedelics that we talked about earlier. What can psychedelics teach us about our industry? And, you know, really like the, the old quote, the ketamine and psychedelics is to psychiatry what the microscope was to biology. Mm. It enhances our ability to look within. And then really, if we want to talk about diagnostics, not just on a piece of paper called the DSM, but emotionally what's going on, physically, spiritually, environmentally. Environmental factors are a big part of our medical health, but who's treating that? Mm. And you think about something like COVID in the last couple of years and the environmental toll that had on all of us really put us in a very rigid mind state. You're in the same house, you're not even vacationing, traveling, seeing new things, your mind loses all that neuroplastic ability that now we know modern science is teaching us about. Mm. These are the things we're trying to crawl out of right now, just in the last two years, let alone the last hundred years of medicine and psychiatry. Mm. And, and being in that state through COVID, have you seen, you know, I know there's a lot of people coming to you, an increase in blank, more anxiety, more depression because of it? And, and what is your theory behind it? Is it the neuroplasticity? Is it they're calling dysregulation in their environment? Is it that we need human connection? We need to feel like we're part of a tribe? What are, you, what are your, both your theories on that? And what are you seeing more of people coming to you saying, sure. this is my chief complaint? All of the above. More anxiety, more depression, more substance abuse, more suicidality, unfortunately. More suicidality with children and teenagers. Growing up, I don't think I knew anybody in my age range as a child or a teenager who even thought about suicide. But now it's a trending topic. And so these things are becoming more and more, unfortunately, prevalent. And I really do think that the more we're learning about the brain and realizing that you know, 20 years ago, do you remember the old quote, don't kill a brain cell, they don't grow back, mm -hmm. right? It couldn't be farther from the truth. <laughs> and our neurons actually replace themselves every 10, 14 years, right? So we get to a point now where we're understanding the brain has the ability for neurogenesis, neuroplasticity to create new neural pathways, but we get in our own way. While children are very neuroplastic, everything is new, fun, they're learning, they're creating, they're playing, their brains are constantly evolving. As adults, we get in our own way. We do the same things every day, routine work, stressors, home life, that we're not getting outside of the box and things, seeing things from a new perspective. Now you look at COVID, the rigidity that that caused uh, of the avoidance of pushing our comfort zone, the addition of fear and anxiety from a health perspective. Mm. Um, you know, there's pivotal times in the timeline of medicine that have really changed the kind of paradigm of the way we practice. Mm. If you go all the way back to this country's origin in the 1700s, our first hospital was in the 1700s, our first medical school was like 1770. And it was a lot of holistic healing because that's all we knew back then, right? Ancient medicines brought now to a more traditional uh, setting. But then you had the Civil War in the 1800s. And do you know more soldiers died from disease than from battle? Mm. So now the medical community is getting, just like the military does for a lot of industries, a lot of extra funding, a lot of accelerated growth. So we're learning things like surgery, antibiotics, all of these things you know, to prevent chickenpox that was killing people back then. Right? Mm. <laughs> um, and so now the public consciousness of health increased because we're seeing all of our brothers 
dying in war, not of battle, but of disease. So we come out of that, and there's a much bigger emphasis on our health. And when public consciousness goes up, this is a good thing, right? We all need to have practice better hygiene. We've learned that being in enclosed um, quarters, you know, is not good. It spreads infection. That's something we didn't know in the 1800s. Then you have Rockefeller coming around, and we live in a capitalistic market, which it's not good or bad. It just is, mm-hmm. right? He says, we need to have, have more of a standard in the way we practice medicine. So now we're creating allopathic medical schools, and we have things that are much more regimented. And we're almost shaming these holistic practices that don't follow this paradigm, this new paradigm in the 19, early 1900s. Fast forward, 1952, the discovery of um, psychotropics, did you know, came from the side effect of a tuberculosis medication, hmm. is- isoniazid. They were giving this to TB patients, and all of a sudden they were noticing these people were a little happier. And they thought, what is going on here? And that was the birth of the serotonin hypothesis, thinking that if we increase serotonin, you'll be happier. So depression must be a serotonin deficiency. This was our knowledge in the 1950s. Then you have Prozac in the 80s, right? And everybody's just, this is the new happy pill. It's making everyone happy. And this is where we came from. So now, when we get to a state where we're talking about holistic care again, this is 100 years of ingrained practice, right? And now we've become rigid. Our medical model needs more neuroplasticity. Mm-hmm. And so psychedelics just came and disrupted that for us. Wow. And, it's, and that model is shaking the whole 100 years of rigidity. Yeah, is absolutely. that why it's met with a rebound resistance now? Perhaps. Um, you know, there's a lot of industries that we would think when you introduce a new medical modality, when you tell people that nutrition is so important, Okay, you've got all of these different lobbyists for you know the food companies, the drug companies, but I'm optimistic. I, I try not to take a pessimistic approach on this because as a capitalistic market, once you bring a healing modality that's working, that's scalable, accessible, affordable, it's not $1,500 in the clinic, mm. it has the right care associated with it, now capitalism is going to bring that to the forefront. Yeah. Right? So I'm optimistic about the future of medicine mm. because of that reason. And, and you know, to touch on what, what Sam said, it's you know our, the approach to to our, our mental health, right? It hasn't really changed since you know the Rockefeller and uh, kind of Freudian uh, you know, methods of diagnose the illness and and treat the symptom, right? It's not actually designed for us to heal or get better, right? Yeah. The system just ha- you know hasn't been. Right? Let's, mm-hmm. You're feeling this, let's take this to cover up that. That doesn't work. Flip the page, do more, right? Yeah. And um, and psychedelics, uh, you know, help us unlock that. Most powerful ability, like you know, what Sam said, yeah, it's healing. Yeah. yeah, that's what you're all about. Your whole platform is bringing that are. education. Heal right. thyself, right? Yeah. And uh, and getting, you know, you get a paper cut, you clean it out, and you don't really, uh, you know, think about it. And, yeah. and our brains, whether it's and a lot of times, you know, people and 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 that, that we talk to and that come to us, you know, they if they've been on. Uh, medications or different types of SSRIs for extended periods of time, you know, they'll come in and say, I, I could see somebody get hit by a car right in front of me and I wouldn't feel anything. You know, I don't feel happy. Mm-hmm. I don't feel sad. I just don't feel anything anymore. I feel like a shell of a human being. I don't connect with my, my kids, my grandkids, my family. And it's really hard, you know, to, to like, for, yeah, for, for everybody around me, yeah. you know, and, and seeing like, not just what, like that immediate psychological or psychedelic effect that um, you know that, that it has. It, it's it's seeing on a neurobiological level how it helps our brain heal itself, right, and, and helps it really optimize that that function and and and, and optimize the organ so it can function better, right. Mm-hmm. And there's not uh, you know if somebody has like liver issues or liver liver failure, you know, nobody's thinking like, oh, that person, you know, has liver failure, shame on them, you yeah. know, and, and I, th- you know, we think that uh, a lot of what, where our, our things stem from is, you know, there's a lot of different factors, right? And then everything from, you know, diets, uh, you know, medication, your lifestyle, like we address all these things, you mm-hmm. know, like, are, are you getting sunshine? Are you getting uh, activity? Are you sweating every day? Because there's no magic pill out there that's going to replace these things, right? And, uh, looking at, yeah, just what is, how how can we optimize our our brain's function in order to give us a, 
a real shot at, at being happy. Yeah. So, all right, look, on the topic of ketamine now, because yeah. this is your, your guy's specialty here, first of all, uh, for those who are viewing and listening, what is it? How does it work? And what is the connection? Do we know what is the mechanism? What's happening in the brain for people who are depressed or suicidal and getting out of that hole out of, out in, what, four hours, you said? Uh, what's happening with, with ketamine? Sure. So ketamine uh, has been around for 50 years, right? This is a drug that's not new to the market. It was a dissociative anesthetic. It was used to help people kind of deal with a, a better way of going through surgery when the opiates weren't there yet. We were using uh, heavy antipsychotics to put people out and do surgery on them. So in the experimentation time, going back um, now to the, to the military, they found soldiers were all of a sudden handling trauma a lot better after they got surgical procedures with ketamine. So we're now correlating. This is a trial and error kind of industry. Unfortunately, we learn from the results a lot of the times because we don't fully understand the brain. So what they noticed was there's something here. Why are these soldiers who got the ketamine treatment doing better afterwards? And psychiatrists in the 70s were all over it. Of course, everybody on this channel probably knows about the war on drugs and how that came to an end. But ketamine was still a prescribable drug, and it was used in operating rooms and procedures. Fast forward to the 2000s, that's when these infusion clinics popped up. And mostly it was pain doctors who were coming in and giving their chronic pain patients ketamine infusions not really knowing exactly how and why this is working and not really fully understanding the mental health component either. But what we now understand about ketamine is that it increases to get technical glutamate activity. And glutamate is in charge, with, in charge of uh, activating our nervous system in a healthy way. And the downstream effect of both kind of having a healthier glutamate level in our brain and BDNF factors and other things that help kind of fertilize the brain, all of a sudden you get neurogenesis, which means new neural pathways. Uh, the dendrites, the axons of the, the nerves, when you see them after ketamine under kind of the way that it affects you, you have branches that just come out in the way that they weren't. So what that translates for the patient is I get to now see my life from a much more flexible perspective. I have these new pathways to think about things from a different place. And maybe I was stuck in a way of thinking. I had these stories, these beliefs, these false fixed perspectives that trauma has caused me, that stressors have caused me. And I'm just stuck in that way of thinking. I get to see things from a new perspective. The neuroplasticity combined with the psychological effect makes you more of an objective viewer of your life rather than a subjective passenger. And as you were alluding to, you know, sometimes we have to look at our thoughts as an observer and not feel like we're embodied by or defined by our thoughts. Because our thoughts, they get the best of us sometimes, right? And our mind should be our servant, not our master. So ketamine has helped to bridge that understanding for people. And sometimes it just takes one treatment for people to recognize, wow, I get to see things from a new perspective and not have to hold on to all of this baggage that I had in my life. We have countless patients who come in and say, it wasn't my intention, but I stopped drinking after my ketamine treatments, or I stopped smoking, or I stopped being mean to my wife. You know, it's mm -hmm. all these things that I knew weren't serving me, I kept doing habitually, but it took me one shift in perspective to realize, why do I want to do this? I love my wife. Why am I adding stress to my relationship? I love my body. Why am I poisoning myself? And so, you know, that really is the profound experience that someone can have from just one ketamine treatment. And some people who have chronic stressors and habitual pathways that need a little bit more rewiring, they can continue it once or twice a week for a month or two. And most people do very well after that. Mm, that's so powerful just to hear that there's something that can reestablish or help grow our neurons. And the connections is the most important part because what I find in my experience with ketamine is that I was like, where did that thought come from? I was like, I never made that connection. And that's exactly the mechanism that was happening. And then the seeing myself as the observer, enough to say, wait, that doesn't serve me. Versus I am that experience. I am that action, right? Mm -hmm. Versus now like unblending from that and looking at it and going, that doesn't serve me. What a powerful agent that can do this. Um, now, I know, Tarek, you wanted to really do this holistic model, both of you. How does that holistic model work? What is, what is the way that you view how people should be 
taking ketamine? Because there's a lot of people who have different views, doing it different ways. Mm -hmm. What is it that you believe in? So you know, there's a, a lot of people doing it different ways, and you know, there's no nobody to say that one way is you know wrong or, or one way is right, right? But in my experience, since you know my own personal initial experience, right, uh, I think that psychedelics can be just as you know traumatic as they can be healing if they're done improperly, and you know when you most people, I'd say you know, over ninety five percent of people that come to us have never tried any type of psychedelic in their life. Um, they're also, you know, nobody comes to us because they're like, I feel great. You know, they come to us because they're going through it, you know, because they're, they're going through a really tough time. Mm -hmm. And, or they're, they're, they're ready for change, right? And they've been going through it. And, uh, you know, based off of, you know, my experience in, in office and, and Sam's, you know, seen this with, with a lot of his, his patients as well, it's, um, there's kind of three stages to the actual kind of treatment part, right? So that then initially, once you you know have the medication, um, you know at, at home, it's you have the absorption period where that first kind of it gives you that 10, 15 minutes of focusing on your intention really and what you want to explore and really quieting your mind and connecting with your breath, right? And, and then you have the part of the session where you're deep in the medicine for 45 to 90 minutes, to, you know, um, based off a few factors, and then. After the session, I think is, you know, one of the most critical parts of it, and that's coming, you know, coming back to reality and coming back into your own skin, and and allowing your brain to come back on its own time and really processing and digesting and reflecting on the shifts and emotions that we're having, that these new kind of epiphanies or aha moments that we're having, like like mm -hmm. you know, like you had, and and um, and these new feelings, right? And 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 how do we, you know. And in that time afterwards, it's very, very powerful for us, right? And 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 writing it down or voice recording, and and with that, like that's how you know we can find lasting changes by coming back and revisiting these feelings and, re, and, and remembering and understanding, you know, that this is this is actually you know, maybe closer to who I am than than what I'm projecting to the world or to to the stories, you know, like like you said, being. You, we are not our thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to step away from 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 that, and in office, I just didn't get that. You know, it, it's it's uh, the treatment prep preparation and making sure that you're mentally, you know, in the right state of mind. And and you know, some like we have our, our uh, integration guides that sometimes you're talking to somebody, you know, and, and they're not ready, you know, mentally to to go into it. Yeah. And we will say today is not the day to do your session, you know. Tonight we need to, you know, get some rest or exercise or, you know, like we'll walk them through or if they need additional medical treatment, then you know we walk them through that. Um post session that's you know critical is is having not only, you know, the medicine is incredibly powerful, which is incredible for transformation, but it's also not something where it should be here, take the medicine, and you know, on a neurobiological level, yes, it is cleaning up things, right, and, and it is helping our brains, you know, function better. But it's also something that afterwards, like people, they want to talk about it and, and and want to process it and want to get off their chest, like, wow, I, you know, I'm having all these realizations and changes, yeah. and and so making sure that they have somebody there to help them. You know, not only process and digest this experience, but holding them accountable to the to the things that they're like. I want to change this, or I'm feeling this, or this isn't serving me. Okay, great. Well, next week, we you know when we talk, let's you know let's stick on this. And then not only looking at you know the medicine is one thing, right? But there's no magic pill that's going to replace you know sunshine, exercise, yeah. food. You know, if I'm sitting around like eating. McDonald's and and you know and Reese's Puffs all day. I'd love to do that, right? But it's uh, it's not going to end up. That's yeah. not going to not going to end well. And you know, and like, like Sam said earlier, it, it was I was blown away when he first told me that, that his entire you know uh, career at med school was uh, his entire time at med school that four hours of that was spent on right. you know, on nutrition, right? So how much in your practice and your training? Was we spent did two on years. Two full years, two man. full years, four semesters. That's the naturopathic. Yeah, four yeah. semesters. Curriculum. It was like amazing. clinical and everything. So is medicine. Is like yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and and you know, so looking at that approach with, with people and and helping them find you know, paths. And and while our brains in this heightened state of neuroplasticity and more malleable, 
you know, doing things that maybe didn't work for them in their traditional kind of CBT exercises, or psychodynamic types of um, therapy that they've had before. But while our brain is uh, more like a sponge, right? It kind of yeah. resets us back and, and it makes it easier to not only break old thought patterns, break old habits, but easier to learn new things. Yeah. And so just small changes, like before you look at your phone, you know, a nice gratitude practice, right? Um, it's changing from when you're looking at your to-do list or thinking about what you have to do tomorrow, like all the things you have to do. It's like, I, you know, I get to do these things, right? Yeah. And just little minor changes in our life that don't really cost us anything except for maybe a few minutes a day. Um, the power of words, of affirmations, and mm-hmm. the stories that we tell ourselves, right? If we're coming out of depression or anxiety and we're so used to telling ourselves, you know, something that's disempowering, yeah. right? And spending that time even in the beginning as, you know, silly as it may feel, but, the, you know, the, over time, um, very quickly, people are like, wow, like, I'm, you know, this, this is now a part of me and, mm-hmm. and then I'm stepping into my power. So really just taking that, and everybody's different, right? But just, you know, trying to meet people where they are and, um, and, and really craft that approach, you know, with them and, yeah, yeah, and 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 that's you said meeting people where they are. It's that for me is the way you personalize it, right? Because the one size fits all for anything. Meeting people where they are, especially mentally, emotionally, is mm-hmm. it's crazy because we're so complex and the, we have so many inputs that affect how we show up in the world. You know, meeting people where they are is essentially, I mean, like one of the most powerful things. What are some of the things you, Doc, that you do to complement? Um, any of these therapies for yourself? Like, what are sure. some of your non-negotiables? Yeah, well, non-negotiables, you know, certainly things that you have to remove from your life. Detoxification is so important prior to treatment because you have to have the body and mind and spirit in a place ready for this treatment. To enhance that, we have a really kind of uh, robust therapy protocol that people use before, during, and after treatment. And it, it comes in four phases. The first phase is heal, interestingly enough. Mm-hmm. And healing is letting go, being ready, giving yourself permission to feel better. Many of my patients don't think they deserve to be happy. And so the healing comes from a combination of that release plus the physical benefits of just getting better sleep, getting better nutrition, all that is part of healing. Once you get past the healing, and it never ends, right? The healing is continuous. The next phase is growth. And growth is where we think more about the traditional cognitive behavioral strategies, increasing neuroplastic habits, recognizing our strengths and honing in on them, recognizing our weaknesses without shame, blame, or judgment, and being able to eliminate, delegate, or improve our weaknesses. Uh, That growth work is also never-ending. This is where medicine stops, right? Let's talk about healing. Let's talk about improving, you know, fix and improve. The next two phases, I think, are the most important. The next one is love. Because you can't be your true self and not incorporate love as part of your healing journey. The interaction with the world begins with your interaction with yourself. And so priming people towards self-love is a really integral part of this. And this is where we get into traditional psychodynamic therapies and looking at past relationships, past experiences, how it molded you, how it created the your ability to both give and receive love or lack thereof. Um, and really, once you tap into the love and empathy, the next phase becomes transcendence. You're healing, you're growing, you're of love. Now let's not focus on ourselves anymore. I heard you talk about therapy recently, talk therapy, and, and how is it helping us and how does mm-hmm. it not help us? And I recall you saying that it's from a place of logic, right? And the mm-hmm. logical mind can help us only so far, but you really have to tap into the rest of the spirit mm-hmm. to advance your health and healing. And so transcendence is realizing that we aren't our thoughts, we aren't isolated as individuals. We're part of a collective community, a collective consciousness. This is a giant organism. And when you evolve beyond focusing on self, not only do your stressors seem more insignificant, but you tap into the ability to be altruistic and give more than you take and find ways where fulfillment really comes from not focusing on self, but focusing on the greater good. And people can find that in any way. Spirituality doesn't have to be religion, right? Spirituality is the idea that there's something more important than self, That could be family, that could be work, that can be your God, that can be nature and community. And so these four phases are the integral part of what we're bringing to the psychedelic space. It's saying, 
there is a structured way to enhance your ability to optimize. Um, and talk therapy can get you so far, but then you have to tap into something that scientifically we can't explain yet. Yet, yeah, hopefully we'll get there. Yeah, I'm waiting for that day for that study to come out, the groundbreaking <laughs> one, man. But yeah, I, I, that's exactly how I feel. And the psychedelic space needs those phases in order to uh, keep unfolding in the most powerful way that is going to serve the people. You know, I, there's so many companies out there that are just like, you know, business entrepreneurs wanting to just capitalize on something that is hot, right, and striking the iron. But, you know, what I hear from you both is integrity, you know, and, and really like, no, we got to do this right. We got to do this from the medical side, really from the spiritual. We got to do this from your experience infused now being like, no, we're going we're gonna to do this right from beginning, middle and end and allowing these people to just heal, you know, heal something that is like, well, what does even heal mean? I just, I feel better like in my body. I don't have pain. No, really heal like mm -hmm. spiritual, mental, emotional. How do you show up in the world? Talked about collective, like remembering that we are part of the bigger collective mm -hmm. and then moving from self to altruism. Holy moly, man. Then you're living a life like fully in alignment. And like, that's the greatest feeling in the world, right? Like there's nothing better than, than helping somebody else and, and, and along with their path or their mm -hmm. journey. And, and there's nothing more fulfilling than that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when you can get people to that state and of living of, serv living of service, like that's incredible. Yeah. Listen, there's two of you, but I wish we had another hour and a half to talk more. Yeah, yeah. We do have a lot to talk about. Maybe we can come to the clinics and, and tour it and, and they'll film yeah. me. They'll film me doing a whole session. You know, yeah. that's, we gotta, that's, that's just like, uh, that'll be amazing. So yeah. we'll talk about that more. Thank you both. How do people find you both? And where do people learn more about the company Better You? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, go to betteryoucare.com. Uh, so www.betteryou, the letter U, care, C-A-R-E.com. Uh, on Instagram, at betteryoucare. Yeah, the other thing we're doing alongside, if you're trying to find your own healing, we can service that. But we also have the Better You Foundation. And what we're trying to do there is raise the mental health awareness that's become trendy, but also bridge access. Very often what's happening in society is we're ready to work on our mental health, right? We, rec we recognize that we all have a mental health journey. But now I called to go find a therapist or a psychiatrist, and they're telling me it's a three-month wait. Or... I thought my insurance covered it, but I got a bill for $3,000. There's all these access points. Or there's the practitioner wasn't very good, right? Mm. So what we've done is we've recruited our whole team of psychiatric professionals and therapists to volunteer their time and go back to that pay-it-forward model, where if you need the care, just come to us. And we'll have a student volunteer coordinate the care for you, make sure you get what you need. We're looking at ways to subsidize ketamine therapy for underserved populations, um, so betteryou.foundation will be a place where you can learn more just about mental health and access for yourself. And if you want to give back to your community, if you're a healer, I'm sure a lot of your audience really finds their own way to help people. We're looking for people who just want to be of love, be of service. Mm -hmm. And increasing access and awareness to, yeah, to every kind of modality outside of just psychedelic therapy. Powerful. And, and uh, on Instagram, doctors at Dr. Sam Zand, <laughs> uh, and mine's at Derek DDD. And yeah, at better you care for the for the company. All the viewers, listeners, go check it out. I love the idea of getting closer to your communities, paying it forward, doing that, doing that beautiful work that you know we're all here to do. We just have these gifts that are different, but we can give it in our own special way. Thank you both for coming, man. Fantastic. Next time you see these two, I'm gonna be at their spot getting my hands dirty on all of it. I want to learn all about it all. I want to experience it all. Thank you both for coming. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And to be clear, you don't have to come to our spot. Our service is an at-home service. Oh, yes. So medications sure. delivered to your home. You mm -hmm. can do it in the comfort of your own setting. Mm -hmm. You have virtual guidance the whole way. But we would, of course, love to have you at our facility sure. in Las Vegas. In the clinic, yeah. Yeah, it'd yeah. be awesome. Thank you both. Appreciate Thank you. you.